Hello and welcome to History 391. Today I want to talk briefly about draft dodging or the concept of draft dodging. Now, the uh, the draft was reformed um, under Nixon at the very end of the 1960s to create more kind of a lottery pick style, which there's a clip uh, attached to this video today on Moodle um, of Billy Crystal, the comedian, discussing his experiences watching this on or reading about it in the newspapers the following day to see if he was drafted. Um, prior to that lottery system, there was a feeling that um, the draft was... Uh, unfairly taking more uh, minority men and men of modest means and everything else, particularly, for example, African-American men. Now, this is a very large and complex idea. Um, the idea of shirking your duty, going on from the video um, the other day, of this idea you know, of, 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 of the perception of the troops changing, that's a long and gradual process. And certainly, whatever way that American popular opinion is shifting and starting to switch from one that is outraged at someone who might not go um, to Vietnam versus being sympathetic to those who don't want to go, this is kind of a gradual process. So for example, more radical anti-war protesters, the same people are already out protesting in, for example, 65, 66, 67, of course they are, they support draft dodging and everything else. Um, there's this large kind of um, complex question about the extent to which you have relatively well-to-do middle-class people protesting in the streets, young men who basically otherwise would be drafted refusing to go to what extent is this self-serving. And this is certainly something that's being sent about on the right um, in America, and not just, you know, some kind of hardcore right political spectrum, but many Americans are concerned about this and upset about this. So much of this was generational, um, so, for example, one of the famous examples that young women uh, would use to protest against their, their fathers, in many ways, but certainly the older generation would be to burn their bra. And this was kind of a classic, you know, um, uh, pro-feminist, anti-patriarchal kind of a statement. The kind of, you know, the act, the act itself was more important than the destruction of the object. And then for men, for young men to refuse to go and serve. And these things change. So by the early 1970s to mid-1970s, uh, public support has largely become very, very permissive of the idea of not going and in fact we've had three American presidents who were old enough to serve in Vietnam who didn't. Um, Bill Clinton um, pretty you know dodged the draft fairly shamefully. George W. Bush had a perhaps um, you know questionable stint um, you know in a, a kind of an, as National Guard service and substitution of it and the, pre the current president President Trump got a doctor to, to say he had bone spurs so he just made up an excuse um, not to go. Um, and none of those three uh, political figures, Clinton suffered a bit of blowback perhaps, but the kind of people who were upset with Clinton in the 90s, this is before he gave people lots of reasons to be upset with him, um, were kind of upset with him anyway. Um, George W. Bush again drew the ire people who didn't like him anyway. Um, and again, you know, President Trump doesn't seem to have paid any massive kind of, um, you know, price for this. That's kind of fascinating. And of course it contrasts massively to arguably the most famous um, draft dodger, if you can call him that. Um, certainly he preferred the statement, conscientious objector, Kentucky native, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali was drafted in 1967 and he refused to go. And this was a fascinating moment because, you know, back in World War II, you had baseball players, uh, you know, who had who had gone and they had served um, and, 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 uh, and then come back and kind of done their duty. And certainly lots of sports teams had made great hay out of this, you know, this great kind of service that these guys have done. And in truth, um, the chances that Muhammad Ali, uh, greatest boxer in the history of the sport, reigning heavyweight champion, the possibility of him being, you know, put in a platoon and sent out in search and destroy missions was not terribly high. But Muhammad Ali at this point, of course, you know, with the, his name Muhammad Ali had converted to Islam long before this point. And, um, which was another thing I think that lots of Americans are trying to deal with anyway, how the young, you know, the Louisville lip, Cassius Clay, had become Muhammad Ali. And, and with that, um, uh, Ali had become very kind of politically radical, at least by the standards of the 1960s. And Ali himself drew very, very clear lines and very clear linkages between um, his decision not to go to war and political positions he had taken back here in the United States. So but it, to, to cut a long story short, Ali, Ali made the argument that he couldn't go as a religious, as a religious uh, out, of, out of religious objections. He didn't, believe in the, he didn't believe in taking human life and he couldn't go because of his faith. And he delivered on that and he talked about this. Of course, he's a very eloquent man 
often talked about it very eloquently and very clearly tied it to the treatment of African Americans back in the United States. Why should I go over there? This is extremely, you know, famous statement he makes, you know, no Viet Cong ever called me, um, you know, the N word, right? This idea um, that, you know, what have they ever done to me? Now, um, and this is kind of a, a fascinating, um, a fascinating element. And rather than try and explain Ali's positions, what I've done is I've attached a couple of links um, to Moodle that are scheduled for today that I strongly encourage you to go um, and listen to and watch and in, well, in the required reading. But but um, I think watching Muhammad Ali is usually a pleasure and a fascinating, fascinating man. And the way he engages with it, and he's very public about it, you know, is a major is is a major deal, and of course they you know he gets in huge trouble for it. The Supreme Court eventually reverses those decisions in 1970, but um, Ali is very up and out in front of the American public and making his statements very clearly. So the discussion question for today is how did Muhammad Ali connect American military action in Vietnam with American social policies back here in the U.S. And to elaborate upon that and discuss it. Um, and kind of maybe give it a little evaluation of how effectively does Ali do this. Okay, thanks for watching.